to you all. Um, we did have a little waiting room music for you there, but it couldn't come through on the share. So um, I, I'm sorry about that. That's, uh, uh, that's the way it goes. But, you know, I, I would uh, uh, turn your attention to, uh, as we were preparing this, I was thinking of uh, Heinrich Goretzky's Third Symphony from 1976, the last uh, of the three sorrowful songs another one about a mother lamenting losing her child to war. So maybe after uh, our presentation, you might wanna reflect with that really, really monumental piece of music from the mid seventies. Uh, anyway, I wanna welcome you, uh, good afternoon, uh, and welcome to another in our ongo ongoing series, uh, um, Conversations on the Catholic Imagination. My name is Michael Murphy, and I direct the Hank Center here at Loyola, Chicago. And on behalf of university leadership, and on behalf of the Hank family, whose generous gift supports our wide programming and initiatives, I extend an additional layer of a hearty greeting. Um, so grateful for the Hank family. I also want to uh, extend a welcome from our dedicated center staff, uh, Megan Toomey, our center manager, and Kathleen McNutt, who is our graduate student assistant. Uh, Megan and Kathleen are most instrumental in uh, preparing and promoting our, our many events, and I remain grateful for their, their work. Uh, today's event is called War, Peace, and the Catholic Imagination. It features National Book Award winning novelist Phil Klein, pardon me, and um, multiple award winning poet Philip Metris. Uh, this event will include shorter readings by both Phil and Philip, interspersed with periods of discussion and reflection, and then opened up uh, to participant comment Q&A, and more on that in a moment. You know, uh, just was, was speaking about this, but usually in March, we, we, we in the Hankster, we always hold an event on Pope Francis and his papacy. We did not schedule one for the first time this year, but Francis will have a seat at our table nonetheless, and it is a grace. Uh, today is the 61st anniversary of his profession of vows with the Society of Jesus, and Saturday is the eighth anniversary of his pontificate. Um, so congratulations, Papa Francesco, you are a blessing to us. And Pope Francis figures in to our topics here today as both, both Phil's uh, and I have been emailing about Pope Francis as we have prepared for our event today. Um, Pope Francis is no stranger to war, having had to navigate its more complex contours as Jesuit provincial in Argentina in the 1970s. Francis devotes significant space to war human conflict, peace, imagination, and reconciliation in his recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti. He concludes the document with a kind of prayer appeal for all people of goodwill. And this is, a, there are a couple of uh, excerpts from that. So Pope Francis writes, in the name of the poor, the destitute, the marginalized, and those most in need whom God has commanded to help as a duty required of all persons, especially the wealthy and those of means. In the name of the orphans, widows, refugees, and those exiled from their homes and their countries. In the name of all victims of wars, persecution and injustice. In the name of the weak, those who live in fear, prisoners of war, those tortured in any part of the world without distinction. In the name of peoples who have lost their security peace and the possibility of living together, becoming victims of destruction, calamity, and war. He continues like this, but then concludes, in the name of God and of everything stated thus far, we declare the adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path, mutual cooperation as the code of conduct, reciprocal understanding as the method and standard. So that's pretty, uh, that's, there are no uncertain terms there. And you hear echoes of other works, other prayers. One mode of dialogue with a long tradition is the arts. Fiction, poetry, film, and the other arts of the beautiful proceed not by dogma, but by drama, by showing rather than telling, by singing rather than demanding. It so happens this was also the preferred theology and pedagogy of Jesus to tell a story or to muse beautifully on its points or a point or a, a scene or an idea. This creates a culture of dialogue. 
and reciprocity, for it honors both the freedom and the capacity for learning and understanding, and for the respect of the hearer, for the hearer of the word, uh, who is a free individual. It also recognizes, on the other hand, implicitly human recalcitrance and obstinance. But we will table those aspects right now, even if they are navigated so expertly and profoundly by both Phil, uh, Philip and Phil in, in their creative work. So uh, that's the kind of introduction to this, uh, this event. Just a couple of announcements, some housekeeping, and then we'll, we'll begin. Uh, thanks for looking at the opening slide. We have two big events coming. March 23rd, the last of our, uh, our four-part series on uh, Catholic social teaching in Catholic higher education. This one's called Beyond Patriarchy, Women and Lay Leadership, featuring Catherine Punzalon Malimos and a response from Kathleen Moss Weiger. Uh, then that's, that's March 23rd. And then on March 25th, our Newman Lecture, which uh, marks the kind of intellectual and personal conversion of a person. We welcome um, Jennifer Frey, uh, who is calling her talk, from the, from the Rust Belt to Rome, Conversion of a Working Class Atheist. So the note on format, um, and uh, on those events, please join us. Uh, registration is always free and uh, we'll see you online. Uh, just one note on format. Uh, it's a Zoom cast, uh, not a webinar, but a meeting. So this means that while the chat is limited, uh, we, we can definitely uh, put it into a good play. So you'll direct all of your comments and questions to me, write me directly, Michael Murphy, and I'll be happy to, uh, <laughs> to navigate them and organize them and collate them and get them into play as best I can. So I appreciate uh, that. That's the best way we get your voice involved and we want your voice involved. So please write as you go. Uh, and thanks very much. So thanks for all that uh, patience, the patience you've shown uh, uh, in listening to the front matter of our event. Let me now introduce our, uh, our, our guests, our esteemed guests and our, our friends, Phil Cly and Philip Metris. Phil Cly is a veteran of the US uh, Marine Corps. His short story collection, Redeployment, won the 2014 National Book Award for fiction and the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Prize for best debut work in any genre, and was selected as one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times. His nonfiction work won the George W. Hunt SJ Prize for journalism, arts and letters in the category of, of cultural and, and historical criticism in 2018. Phil's writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, the New Yorker, and the Brookings Institution's Brookings Essays, Brookings Essays series, excuse me. Phil currently teaches fiction at Fairfield University in Connecticut. Welcome, Phil, good to see you again. Philip Metris was born in San Diego, California and grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. He has written numerous books, including Shrapnel Maps, Sand Opera, and The Sound of Listening. A scholar of war literature, Phil wrote the critical study Behind the Lines, War Resistance Poetry, on the American home front since 1941. Phil is the recipient of many awards, including fellowships from the Guggenheim and Lannan Foundations, uh, an NEA award, and three Arab American book awards. Philip is professor of English and director of the Peace, Justice, and Human Rights program at John Carroll University in Cleveland, Ohio. So without further ado, uh, please, Phil Cly, uh, the Zoom stage is yours, and thanks again for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much. Good to see you again, even if, 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 if only virtually, and, and, and thanks to everybody um, who's tuning in. It's a real thrill to be doing this, um, uh, to be doing this with, with Loyola and the Hank Center. I uh, had a really profoundly um, moving time uh, the last time I was with you guys, um, and I couldn't be more pleased to be doing this with Philip, uh, who's a poet I've really admired for some time and whose shrapnel maps is just astounding um, uh, in every way. Um, so uh, in, in terms of, of the subject matter today, before I get into the, the quick readings, I sort of think about the, the challenge I think that, that a war writer, particularly somebody uh, with a Catholic sensibility, uh, is, is, is trying to bring to bear. So, 
you know, Hopkins tells us that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Um, but for the war writer, that can be somewhat difficult, right? Uh, Joseph Helen, Heller's Yossarian's world, right, in, in Catch-22, is not grand, it's trying to kill him. And Thomas Pynchon's world is a vast but horrifying interconnected web trapping human flies by the tens and hundreds of thousands, where, quote, a million bureaucrats are diligently plotting death and some of them even know it. As modern men and women, especially of a literary sensibility, we've been disabused of the old lie about war, and we know you're not supposed to suggest lofty ideals have any place in the ugly realities of the subject. I had seen nothing sacred, Hemingway told us in A Farewell to Arms, and the things that were glorious had no glory, and the sacrifices were like the stockyards that Chicago, if nothing was done with the meat except to bury it. There are many words that you could not stand to hear, and finally, only the names of places had dignity. Certain numbers were the same way and certain dates and these, but the names of the places were all you could say and have them mean anything. Abstract words like glory, such as glory, honor, courage, or hollow were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the numbers of roads, the names of rivers, and or the, the numbers of regiments and the dates. Okay, very well, Bernie. And yet there's that word, dignity. An abstraction like the rest, but deeply felt. Perhaps we're not so cynical as we think we are. Yes, he's rejecting some abstractions, but only those that have drifted so far from reality that they paper over our real ugliness. The seemingly concrete names of villages and the numbers of roads that mean so much to his narrator are not simple matter, but gesture toward the blood and pain and sacrifice, as well as towards the respect those things are due. Here, we're edging closer to what the poet David Jones whose experience in World War I led him to Catholicism, was getting at when he said he wanted his poetry to be incarnational. Against a false dichotomy with abstractions on one hand and concrete reality on the other, his view was the Catholic one, that the human soul and the matter that it informs in <clears throat> constitutes one substance, carnal and spiritual. Tom Slay has argued that in Jones' great World War I poem, in parenthesis, Jones makes the war so physically immediate that abstractions evaporate the terrible physicality of the war registers in our senses before lodging in the understanding. And of course, from an incarnational perspective, physicality is not mere materiality. Jones first considered converting after seeing a priest conducting masks in an outhouse near the front lines and being struck as the priest handed out the Eucharist by, quote, the oneness between the offerant and those tufts that clustered round him in the dimly lit fire, a thing I had never felt remotely as a Protestant at the office of Holy Communion. The distinctive qual quality of the Eucharist, of course, was that it was not mere symbol, not mere abstraction, but the thing itself. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, St. Paul tells us. And that proclamation is not an event in the past, but a present reality made active through the celebration of the Mass. As Jones would later put it in a description of the Eucharist, nothing could be less representational or further from realism or more near reality than what is intended and positive. War, of course, is a province of force that makes people think. And modern war, in which killing can be done from an exceptional distance with almost no cost or notice by the population waving it, is the province of abstract systems causing very real damage to human flesh. But the question for the war writer, I think, is to capture both those systems with a, which obliterate the human, seek to reduce it to mere materiality, and to call witness to the grandeur of God present in the concrete and physical world. That's why I I try to follow in the shoes of a Catholic writer like Jones, who still believes in the meaning of things, that there's a space for sacredness amidst the senseless slaughter because of the presence of human beings and a natural landscape charged with real grandeur. In a way, I think the slaughter in works with this sensibility is more devastating than in works that are more straightforwardly cynical. In the wake of true horror, cynicism is an escape and nihilism is comforting, but it doesn't work in the end because it doesn't accurately represent the world. Things of real meaning and sacredness are being destroyed. And so I'm going to give you a little bit from the beginning of my book, um, which tries to capture a little bit of what is lost when violence is done. And this is from the perspective of one of the main characters, Adele. It's just the beginning of the book. My town sat on top of a small hill by the side of a river whose banks held only sand. At noon, you had to walk, walk quickly so as not to burn your feet. But when it rained, the river would overflow and turn our central street to mud. All us children would go out 
slipping and pushing each other, playing in the mud before the sun baked hard and the wind carried it away as dust. To talk about this part of my life is to talk about another person, like a person in a story, a boy with a father and mother and three sisters, one pretty, one smart, and one mean. A grandfather who drank too much and beat everyone at dominoes, a teacher who thought the boy had talent, a priest who thought he was wicked, friends and classmates and enemies and girls he watched with increasing wonder, like Jimena, who had thick curly hair and fair skin and who got pregnant with the baby of one of the local guerrilleros. Most people think that a person is whatever you see before you walking around in bone and meat and blood, but that is an idiocy. Bone and meat and blood just exists, but to exist is not to live. And bone and meat and blood alone is not a person. A person is what happens when there is a family in a town, a place where you are known, where every person who knows you holds a small invisible mirror and in each mirror held by friends and family and enemies is a different reflection. In one mirror, the sweet fat boy I was to my mother. In another, the little imp I was to my father. In another, the irritating brat I was to Gustavo. A person is what happens when you gather all these reflections around a body. So what happens when one by one, the people holding those mirrors are taken from me? It's simple, the person dies. And the bone and meat and blood goes on walking the earth as if the person still existed when God and the angels know he doesn't. So that is Abel. And I'm going to give you something from the very end of the book. And this is um, there's a character, Juan Pablo, who ends up working in Yemen as a mercenary. And he's been trained in a style of, of targeting, right? Targeting human beings um, that he has learned from the Americans, right? As an army officer in Colombia. Over the past two decades, America has developed a very sophisticated system for finding and eliminating uh, enemies, right? And the system involves a variety of different parts um, and it has some roots in Colombia. It's one of the reasons that, um, that I picked Colombia as, as the subject of the novel. Um, but to give you an example, in 2004, uh, US Special Operations Command in Iraq is, conducting about 12 killer caption mission, capture missions a month. By 2006, you know, we're in the hundreds, right? In terms of missions that are done. Sometimes there are missions that, you know, one team goes out early in the evening and the inter, inter, intelligence that they gather is being used to send another team out that same night. And the difference in terms of what happened in 2004 and 2006 is not that say, you know, the Navy SEALs, the Army Rangers, you know, went to the gym and got more buff and, uh, you know, better at doing their job. It's a, the system which is tying together technologies, direct action units like Navy SEALs or Army Rangers, um, uh, and all the kind of various different agencies that need to be involved in analyzing and exploiting intelligence and then acting on it that system became very, very tight, right? Um, and refined. And that system, which is extremely deadly, has been applied around the world and just been taught, taught other people how to do it. And they're doing it in Yemen. And so this is a, a moment in the book where they have, um, they had killed someone and then they're, they were observing a funeral uh, with the, to see who, had, who showed up and who they might target again. And they're about to sort of uh, hit them. And Juan Pablo is in the United Arab Emirates, but he's uh, helping direct this stuff uh, that's going on in Yemen. Juan Pablo closed his eyes, took in the hum of the operations center. He wondered if the men who were about to die were capable of appreciating everything that went into their deaths. An American mercenary was aiming a laser 
at the instruction of an American pilot operating a Chinese drone. They were communicating over an encrypted frequency routed through a Canadian aircraft mounted with Swedish surveillance technology, bounced from repeater hub to repeater hub to the main air ground tower at their air base in the empty quarter. The drone pilot, in turn, was communicating with an Emirati fighter pilot, fighter pilot in an American aircraft armed with a laser-guided bomb capable of being launched from nine miles away and 40,000 feet up and still detonating within 10 feet of its target. He heard someone clear the pilot's hot. Was it Jeffy? It didn't matter. He knew, as everyone in the operations center knew, that in another country, miles and miles away from the men of another religion and another way of life, breathed their last. They knew, and the ground team knew and the pilots knew, but no one else. Then, thousands of feet above the target building, the pilot did nothing more complicated than push a little button. A series of small charges on a rack mounted underneath his plane ignited, blowing away the hooks holding his bomb in place. It wobbled out into the air, awkward, ungainly, a baby bird the size of a car, detached from its parent and plummeting through space, or almost detached. A thin wire trailed behind it, still connected to the jet, unspooling and unspooling and unspooling until there was no more wire left and it tore itself from its mother. Only then did it open its eyes. A sensor on the nose locked onto the sparkling building, four fins at its tail extended outward. It adjusted the angle of its fins, added lift, stability, no longer plummeting, it flew. So many things had to happen for these men to arrive at their deaths. Start with the invention of the internal combustion engine, follow with the development of Europe and the Americas and the rest of the world, creating a ravenous appetite for oil, which created oil rigs and refineries and massive wealth for desert, desert princes. Then global supply chains, trade agreements, secure shipping routes and the law of the sea, negotiated arms sales too. Add in the vast edifice of Western science, computing and radio technology, the space race and the microchip, Silicon Valley and the military industrial complex and other subtler developments. American pioneered methods of high value targeting, the post 9-11 explosion of private military contractors. It took all of the massively complex interconnected modern world to bring these men to their deaths. It was a shame they were incapable of appreciating. There we go. Thanks, Phil. Uh, that's a great, uh set of readings to get us thinking. And, and I appreciate your setup as well. So Philip Metris, what are you hearing uh, in those texts? Anything moving in you uh, to respond to Phil? Um, Phil, thank you so much for that reading. And, and um, one of the things I was thinking about was a debate that actually happened in the poetry world um, mm -hmm. during the Vietnam War which was between, not really a debate, but an argument among friends that, that, that ruined a friendship. It was between Robert Duncan and Denise Levertov, Levertov who would end up converting to Catholicism. Um, Duncan was angry with Levertov because her poems were increasingly prophetic and anti-war. And what Duncan said was, um, Denise, you, you don't understand that our, poet, our, our job as writers, as poets, is not to oppose evil, but to imagine it. And um, one of the interesting things I think about what I've um, read so far of this book and of the question of the Catholic imagination around this is that there's a tension between those two, you know, longings, right? The, um, and so I'm wondering if you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, I think there's a, um, <laughs> there's a, in very good writing, I think there's a, what, what Iris Murdoch talked about as like a small c conservative element, which is you, you're trying to describe the world, right? You're trying to, to show, um, to show your, 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 your audience what it is that you're seeing. And you know, that's why Flannery O'Connor you know, so it, it wasn't the writer's mind necessarily that was their great gift, it was their eye, right? And <laughs> so that's restricting in some way because, um, you know, the, the, the temptation, especially when you're dealing with something that is, that you find morally 
uh, morally repulsive or, or morally troublesome or, or where there's where you have a strong political conviction, right? Is that the temptation is to reduce the complexity of reality in order to guide the reader toward your particular convictions, right? Rather than exploring the complexity of political emotions, right? Rather than getting them to fully enter um, enter the world uh, in a rich way, which would then sort of call forth who knows, you know, what from from the reader. I mean, one of the, the kind of funny things about really good literature is oftentimes it gets read by people um, of radically different politics and ideas and sensibilities than, than what the authors ever would have intended, you know, um, and yet can become powerful, powerfully useful tools uh, for people of the exactly opposite of ideological persuasions because, um, you know, whatever the um, the failings or blind spots or, or you know particular idiosyncrasies idiosyncrasies of you know Ezra Pound <laughs> um, or Celine right um, in that small c conservative way they were capturing a piece of reality in a very important way but there's also I think a kind of progressive or revolutionary aspect of art right which is that in the process of art you're not just you're not just trying to do mimesis. You're not just trying to reproduce reality. You're 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 crafting a new way of seeing. You know, when I um, when I read Frank Bernard, um, I'm encountering the world in a way that I never have before. Right. I mean, that's why you know, and in a very different way when you're reading Gerard Manley Hoskins, right, and um, and the work itself. Is 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 a thing in the world, um, and it 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 can sort of open you to new possibilities and new connections, um, and so I think that I think that tension has always been there, um, but it's it's like a, it's it's a way of seeing that that kind of gets across so powerfully to me, less so than particular sort of especially sort of narrow political convictions, right? Um, I think really good art calls forth a political response from us uh, and should engage with politics because politics is a part of our life. It's how humans decide how to live together, right? Um, how could that not be an apt subject for, for fiction? Um, and yet the ways that it does so are, are chaotic. <laughs> um, and if they're not chaotic, I think oftentimes uh, it's because the writer is not doing, doing their job. Um, Let me jump in there, Phil. Um, I think you're you're onto something when you amplify the importance of seeing and, and citing O'Connor is perfect, who famously said, nothing is profane for those who know how to see. And so, um, and then the example Philometris of Levertov, she, she commits two crimes as far as Duncan is concerned. The first is to dally around in politics. And the second is to <laughs> dally around in religion, which she does next. <laughs> you know, she goes from those, she has kind of a, her, her reversion, if that's the right, you know, term for it, uh, to a theological stance and conversion is, uh, is an aesthetic one primarily, but it comes from seeing and making. So that's quite wonderful. Uh, at the risk of, Philip, please jump in too, but I want to, I want to uh, hit your bookends, Phil Cly, and um, the David Jones and his his seeing of a of a, yeah. of a priest doing what a priest does in the chaos of war uh, and being moved by it reminds me of someone who's in the news these days, um, Father Emil Capone. Have you been following that story at all? Uh, no. now a servant of God. Maybe Philometrics, have you been following that at all? No, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not, I won't spend too much time, but this is a priest in, uh, who got the Medal of Honor from Barack Obama. Um, which is a, a, an award for altruism, basically. But he uh, served in World War II and Korea and uh, saved hundreds of lives, and he's, uh, he's a hero. So um, something to think about there uh, and um, to, to dwell on. But Philip uh, uh, Metris, did you have any other insights? What, what, what else moved in you in your hearing of, uh, of Phil's reading? 
Well, I, the last sentence that he read was so powerful because I think one of the things that uh, that novels do well, and I hope that maybe some of my poems are trying to do, is to demonstrate the way in which human beings are caught in systems that they have not constructed yet uh, inside of which they are either complicit, uh, or, uh, complicit or victims and sometimes both, right? And uh, mm -hmm. that, that sentence to me was such a powerful um, rendering it's too bad that this person couldn't see the system for the, uh, uh, you know, and, and that's, I, that goes back to that question of the imagination. I mean, one of the things that strikes me so uh, forcefully is the ingenuity of military um, mm -hmm. means and um, that the imagination is, is, is not, an, you know, inher inherently good thing because we can see how our, we've used imagination in all sorts of incredibly, um, perverse ways as well. Uh, and so I thought that your work really balanced uh, from the particular to the that systemic level kind of analysis. I, I wonder, and, and I'm really interested actually in why you chose Columbia uh, more um, and, and your process of research and sort of thinking about those, those layers of the sacred individual, the dignity of each person um, alongside these sort of the, the, the profanity of some of the systems in which we find ourselves. Right, yeah, a variety of reasons. I mean, there's so much cross-pollination between Colombia and, and um, uh, the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, right? So we, that sort of method of targeting uh, that I talked about, sort of an early version of it was, was developed in the hunt against Pablo Escobar. Then it gets used in, in the Balkans, and then from 2004, 2006, it becomes extremely sophisticated. We build up a, a kind of, we build it into an industrial scale system uh, that we're using all over the world. And, you know, there's a character in the book who's talking about it. He says, um, you know, when most people think of a drone strike, right? They think it's kind of creepy, this kind of cold mechanical soulless thing, killing somebody from miles away. When they think of, you know, a team of Navy SEALs going in and doing a raid, they think of, you know, uh, it's cool, right? And traditionally heroic. But from the perspective of the targeting system, that's just, you know, that's just the flathead and the Phillips head screwdriver at the end, right? And that system we have helped other countries with. And starting in the mid 2000s, we helped the Colombians with it, right? We started giving them smart bombs, we started helping them with targeting, uh, and we started killing. Uh, high-ranking members of the, the these two different main uh, Gedija groups, right? And so uh, at the same time, you have special forces units. So if you look at a unit like 7th Group, right, which is the U.S. military special forces unit that was designed to focus on Latin America, right? Uh, Spanish-speaking, uh, uh, they used to call it the Puerto Rican Mafia, um, uh, and then like... Uh, diversified, um, uh, but um, they have done deployment after deployment after deployment to Afghanistan. The last, the, uh, the, the two last um, American soldiers to die in Afghanistan uh, were from seventh group and one of them had, had deployed 10 times uh, in as many years, right? And they, and so, you know, there were units that were going time and time again to Afghanistan, but then also going to Colombia and working with the Colombian military. Uh, and so it just seemed like this very interesting way to look at the ways in which, you know, there's a kind of, so you know, the beginning begins with a kind of organic community, right? He was talking about the, the ways that a person is a reflection of this sort of community he's grown up with, right? And that is this organic thing that develops out of the bonds between people. Um, but <laughs> whereas the sort of systems of warfare also kind of proliferate <laughs> and cross pollinate um, uh, in a way that seems uh, not organic, right? But more like a kind of dead mechanical reproduction <laughs> um, and, uh, and then sort of impacts with those sort of local organic things. And, you know, I wanted to have in terms of the way the book is structured, there's Avel who you sort of see it's kind of closest to the ground of this one region that's going to be profoundly affected by these changes happening at higher levels. There's a Colombian character 
who, you know, is, is um, in the Colombian military, uh, who, you know, is sort of looking at the Colombian military's interests in this region. There's an American character uh, who's in the special forces and he, you know, is gonna be kind of like looking at it from another degree of distance. And then there's a journalist who ultimately is gonna try and sort of uh, figure out how the, all these pieces fit together. Um, and so they're sort of at different levels of distance and, and each of them have kind of problems with the institutions that they're a part of. Um, and so they're kind of involved in institutional part, fights about you know, what the purpose of special forces is and whether it's lost its way, it's been doing all these extremely violent missions in Afghanistan uh, and so on. Um, and then to see the way these kind of institutional structures maneuver these, these people together uh, in the final third of the novel is kind of basically the, the idea of it. I think it's a masterly structure uh, uh, that, you, that you've uh, imagined and you've sustained, Phil. Um, and on the points of, you know, and you're really, um, you give no truck to simple answers. You capture mm -hmm. the uh, complexities of, wow, I mean, there's so much, it's so global, but there's always like these players in, in Colombia, there's the narco terrorists, there's FARC, there's guerrillas, there's uh, one week you're on this side, the next week you're on that side. And the people always who lose are the people, are, are the people. Uh, and so, uh, people like Alma and people like Abel. Abel is, you know, he has his humanity stolen from him. And I think that your meditation on what a person is, is really uh, uh, a tour de force. That is, that, that's a, a beautiful part of the book. And there's so many beautiful parts. Uh, Sarah's character at the end there, you know, a student, she says, she observes, uh, left and right uh, long ago collapsed into each other. This is what capital does. You know, so, and I'll, you know, I think there's this, this character in this book is this kind of neoliberalism that, that's, that, that uh, is boiling and, and, and moving everything. On the one hand, you know, our, our politics are riven by neoliberalism. On the one hand, we have, uh, you know, the what, uh, the, hu the humiliated on the one hand and the hubristic on the other. And there's just something nasty going on there. But I, uh, you know, then Sarah says, I'm done with human rights. <laughs> you know? And her, her friend says, are you going to finish the class? Oh, yeah, I'll finish the class, you know, on Zoom. But I'm done. You know, I just I'm just like, oh, my God. So uh, any thought on that, Phil? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so she's a kind of radical student who so one of the characters uh, is so Juan Pablo's daughter ends up getting involved in human rights work in in. Uh, Abel's region, right? And um, Juan Pablo is is very skeptical about this, um, <laughs> and you know, I mean, part of that is is you know, I'm I'm like a I'm a parent, I, you know, I my wife and I've had three kids uh, while while I was working on this book, I'm putting it out, and I was definitely thinking about fatherhood and. Uh, <laughs> Juan Pablo is kind of trying to like shape and control uh, his daughter and the ideas that she's going to have in the world. Uh, and she's not really uh, taking the lessons in, uh, in the way that he hoped. Um, and they involve, get, you know, get involved in, in working with this human rights organization, but uh, it becomes a sort of messy, murky thing as they're uh, in this small town where there's a kind of power struggle going on. And uh, this, narcissistic dying like former paramilitary uh, has kind of moved in and is trying to kind of expand operations right using their town as a base of operations and the person running the sort of local organization uh, has made the sort of a kind of delicate peace with him in order to continue the work that she's doing um, and so the radical student who's there Sara um, Sort of is 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 done with human rights work. Is, you know, is, is is done with all this. She wants the kind of, I think the, almost like the, the simplicity of, uh, of radicalism is like this whole thing is corrupt, right? Um, you know, society is 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 riven with compromises with moral evil, um, and so, you know. 
to hell with it all. And of course, the, the way that human rights discourse happened in Colombia around that time was complicated because there was a peace deal going on and human rights discourse was used against the peace, the peace treaty with the FARC, right? Because the FARC had, com had committed very serious human rights abuses. Um, and, you know, I think uh, there's a way in which sometimes you think that simply telling the stories of the oppressed, right? Um, has a sort of political valence, but it doesn't, right, necessarily. The stories of the oppressed can have a variety of political valences, right? Uh, hawks were very into stories of oppression um, from Iraq prior to the Iraq war, right, for obvious reasons. Um, and so the... Um, during the campaign in, in the lead up to this vote over whether it was going to be a historic peace treaty with the FARC or not, human rights were, were employed against the treaty. Um, <laughs> there are other, you know, there are other ways in which uh, uh, it just became a complicated, morally fraught enterprise to try and practically work in the real world given uh, the power power structure of various different regions, right? And, and where is the space for pragmatism? And where is the space for, uh, you know, following your ideals? And for all the characters in the novel, there's, you know, they have these kind of ideals that are guiding them forward. This is for pragmatics. There's their careers often uh, that get involved. And uh, the Sar character ultimately is, has, has taken steps that, that, um, that resulted in, in, in somebody's death. Uh, and at the end, she sort of repudiates everything, but is also not not so interested in looking at the wreckage um, left behind by what she's done. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, Phil Metris, anything to add there? Um, you know, I'm going to talk for a, just a moment about um, in a moment about the Northern Ireland peace deal and precisely the tension between having cre creating a political solution or political process the good friday accord was in direct um conflict with the rights and needs of victims and this is right. this is one of the most painful things about any peace process is that um that there are many people whose uh whose lives are never restored who for whom justice is never served and they become sort of sacrifices to a larger a whole, you know, the hope for a larger peace, you know, where, where guns are not, you know, going to solve everything, so. Right, well, you know, one of the people I was thinking about, because in, in the book, there's this tension between sort of society moving forward, reconciliation, peace, and then, you know, justice is this other thing, right? And, and there's a character who explicitly says, you know, that she's interested in mercy, and mercy is always an injustice, right? Um, because, you know, if somebody deserves forgiveness, if they deserve reconciliation, then giving it to them isn't mercy, it's just, it's just justice. Um, and, um, and so <laughs> the, um, there's Jeanne Marie, um, was a survivor of, of, of Auschwitz, he was tor tortured by the Gestapo and then sent to Auschwitz and survived. And he has this very powerful set of reflections uh, on that experience. And one of them is called Resentment, where he begins his essay talking about how sometimes, writing in the 1960s, I'll go through a thriving land, right? Uh, where statistics will tell you the average man, man and woman is doing quite well. And, and the resentment that he feels, and of course the resentment that he feels is because he's going through West Germany. And he wants, and, and he writes the essay to justify his feeling of resentment, which, you know, ethicists and, and psychologists alike have condemned. He knows that uh, holding on to his resentments, he says it nails every one of us on the cross of his ruined past. But because there'd been no justice, he wants time to stop until, you know, he wants there to be no reconciliation until the entire nation wanted what had happened to have not happened as much as he wanted it to have not happened, right? Um, and he says, what happened happened. This sentence is just as true as it is hostile to morals and intellect, right? Um, and he wanted a revolt against reality, a moral turning back of the clock. He says, you know, only I know, right, what I suffered, right? Not Waj, the SS man who beat me every day, and not society, which cares only about its continued existence, right? And he rejects reconciliation. He rejects atonement as having, quote, only theological meaning, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think it is a, it's a powerful moral complaint, but it's also societally, it, it, it's, it's a dead end, right? Um, and it's, it's not a, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I think a lot about this sort of his discussion of reconciliation, of, of redemption and, and atonement as having only theological meaning in that regard, right? Um, because what do you do with people who have suffered the sorts of things that he did, right? What would, you know, uh, redress even begin to look like, right? In the wake of that kind of horror, right? And that kind of horror multiplied out, um, you know, by the millions. And yet, of course, you know, the demand for society to stop moving is its own kind of moral horror. When I was, uh, thank you, Phil. When I was a younger teacher, I, I, I met a, a dentist named Dr. Rene Molo of Blessed Memory. And he was a Holocaust survivor. He's now passed, but he decided uh, he came and he came and shared his story at my class with my classes when I was a young teacher, and uh, the the kind of hope filled, starry eyed young suburban kids would say after he presented, you know, he's a dentist, so you imagine what he did, what his job was. Uh, he had to extract the gold from teeth and all that stuff uh, of corpses from corpses. Um, and the, the kids would ask him, well, have you, ha have you uh, forgiven the Germans? You know, and I think every time I, I just would, um, uh, their spirit was moving in me in my own way, but it was, um, he would, he's, I said, I am allergic to Germans, hmm. you know, and they would just writhe in their chair because it doesn't fit their narrative of, you know, reconciliation. And right. so I, you know, Philip uh, Metris uh, is about to lead us on and Philip, Metris lives in these zones in uh, shrapnel maps, um, which is a beautifully designed book. Uh, but before we turn to Philip Metris, um, can we, um, Phil Cly, a final word up from your reading, anything moving in you, but I wanna thank you for, for that. Clap my hands. Was there any final thought from you before we come back to Phil? I mean, I'm, I'm eager to hear from Phil. Yeah. <laughs> Other Phil. Yeah. This is well, quite a, yeah. Good. It was uh, wonderful to have a such a fill-filled conversation. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Catholic it's, imagination and war. Yeah, it's we are. Uh, yeah. So uh, everybody, let's just thanks Phil Clive for his work. Uh, you know, this is a. Uh, I hate to throw the word around, but it's a tour de force missionaries, and these are two beautiful books, very different, but uh, lots of overwhelming. Uh, material but lots of grace and lots of things that, that join them together so um without further ado philip metris please um take it away thanks michael and and thanks phil and thanks as well to the hank center and and megan toomey for setting this up and thanks to all of you i know that that uh, zoom is um it's a very difficult medium, but I'm seeing all your faces here. For those of you who have your faces on the camera, you're brave souls. Thank you for, for taking this time with us and um, for being present. Um, it's, it's just such a, such a strange, such a strange medium. But, um, you know, I wanted to start actually with a little anecdote, which was um, I was teaching us this course on the troubles and the peace in Northern Ireland. Uh, Tom, we see your hand and you'll definitely be part of the process. Um, and one of these students re responded after I was teaching them a little bit about nonviolent communication and, and, pe and peacemaking, some general skills to peacemaking. I taught them um, some of the parts of John Paul Lederach's The Moral Imagination in which he outlines four capacities to the moral imagination, uh, compassion, curiosity, uh, creativity and, and courage. And my student responded, you know, you know, I grew up Catholic, she's, she's still Catholic, and I grew up always being asked to pray for peace, but I was given no skills in figuring out how to be a peacemaker or how to build peace in my society. And I thought that that is a deeply Catholic predicament that we found ourselves in, in contrast to the Mennonites or the Quakers, I was just giving a talk at Goshen a couple of days ago 
uh, how much the historic peace churches centered their thinking on uh, about war in a witness against violence and in a whole practice of peace building and peacemaking. Thankfully, for those of you who haven't read it, um, Pope Francis's recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti, um, sort of we are all brothers and sisters, um, is, a, is a remarkable document, a real groundbreaking document in, in Catholic thinking, bringing together and uh, holding up the peace tradition within our own church. We've been so dominated by the just war tradition, which has its importance in its own way, of course. But how, how deeply moved I was to read his call for us to be artisans of peace, to be architects of peace, that each of us has a role to play in our own society, in our lives and in the world to do more than, uh, than simply be a, a faithful person, but to be someone who's helping to build a world where everyone has dignity. And I'm glad that Phil mentioned that word dignity. Um, so this book, Shrapnel Maps, that was published last year um, is kind of a long meditation through poems on the Israeli and Palestinian predicament. And as such, because I am neither Palestinian nor Israeli, um, I can only speak for my own understanding and my own experience. I can only speak for myself. But what I hope I've done in this book is enabled readers to accompany myself through a process of encounter, listening, engagement, and understanding. Um, so I teach at John Carroll University, a Jesuit college just down the road. And I am situated, I live in a neighborhood that's predominantly modern Jewish Orthodox. The book often toggles between my neighborhood and the, and Israel Palestine, that place, however we want to call it. Um, and as such, my, my connection to that place is, is various. Obviously our, our, our faith traditions connect us, but my sister, I have a deeply personal connection, which is my sister met a Palestinian man after living at, um, in the West Bank many years ago and ended up marrying him. And we went to the, to the wedding. And so he became part of our family. And I got to witness firsthand uh, both the kind of bitterness of military occupation under, under which Palestinians live in the West Bank, and also the sweetness of uh, village life, of Palestinian village life, and trying to deal with both of those things at the same time brought me back home trying to understand more. Um, I, I had been educated well, I think, um, in a variety of ways about the the Holocaust and the, and the depredations that Jewish people have experienced over the millennia. Um, so it was very hard for me to understand and to, to feel compassion for what Palestinians were going through until my sister came back with those stories and until I saw for myself what was happening. And of course, there's no comparison of suffering, but that predicament, that complexity, that, um, that reality that people are dealing with systems that are beyond their control is something that I, I felt very, uh, very much part of the experience. Um, so I'd like to share with you some poems. Uh, here's a poem that took place at more or less in this fashion at my university. Um, it's called Family. And I think it articulates kind of the dilemma of being a person who wants to understand and wants to do better. So here it is, family. At the Catholic University, a speaker clicks through slide after slide of barbed wire, cattle shoot checkpoints and walls. His mantra, occupation. What threatens the Christians, he concludes, is what threatens Palestinians. A woman stands up. I wanted to let everyone know, she says, that this talk was full of spin. I can't see her, she's behind me, I'm afraid to look back. The truth is the opposite. My heart goes out to her, standing in the heart of another country. The reason for the wall was that people were being attacked, she says, by terrorists. After all, the Arabs sold the land, it was too much trouble. I shrink back in my seat. 
And at a Catholic school, you should know what the church has done, especially during World War II. Then a man gets up. I can't see him. He's behind me. I'm afraid to look back. The Jews bought a tiny bit of land, but the rest, the rest was stolen. My heart goes out to him, standing in the heart of another country. But, he says, they did not buy everything, even if they buy Congress. I shrink again. She says, you have 14 Arab countries. Can't we have just one? They should take you in. He says, but this is our land. Why should we have to leave? Because Europe took it from us? That is why we fight. What about peace, someone mumbles. He says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side continues to eat? She says, how can you negotiate over a pizza when one side's trying to stab you with knives? It goes on like this for a long time, years, decades, generations. I sit like a child at the table, watch parents grip utensils, spit words like shrapnel. I hate how I love them. Ashamed, I look down, unable to bury the hot metal. So this is a poem about many things, of course, not only these two narratives in which each person has a truth to tell the audience and each other. And yet in the process of telling their truth, somehow kind of is unable to see the pain and the truth and the reality of the other. And of course, the third person is myself. And I felt this so many times. Uh, caught in a, in a situation of frozenness, of inability to know how to, how to proceed. And I wish, of course, when this happened, it, more or less in this fashion, that I had welcomed each person, you know, who was, a, you know, in some sense, a stranger in that space, who probably didn't feel at home, who probably felt that they were the only person. Um, and of course, you know, there probably would have been no agreement, but at least we would have been there together and, and sort of, you know, the frame of this poem is family, because I do feel that, um, that we are family, um, whether we're Jews or Catholics or Muslims. And uh, that doesn't make it any easier as Phil's character is named, you know, Abel, it's Abel, you know, like even in the Bible, brothers kill brothers. So um, as I, one of the things I want to do in this book is move past this kind of complexity or move past the set of frozenness and also try to elevate some people who've done acts of moral courage, who've, who've stood in solidarity with people. And one of them is an amazing man um, by the name of uh, Rabbi Arik Asherman. Um, and I'd like to share uh, uh, an image of him so you can see him in action. Um, just give me one second here. That's the book. That's my sister at, at our wedding. That's me. It's a little bit from the, I don't want to, that's my neighborhood. This is the reality that that, that uh, woman was articulating. And this is the reality that that Palestinian man was articulating. Um, and this is our brave man, Rabbi Eric Osherman. This is based on an interview that he gave, I, I sort of, borrowed, remixed, and uh, made this into a bit of a sonnet. It's called According to this Midrash for Rabbi Arik Asherman. The Midrash says, when Hagar and Ishmael are banished into the desert, before God builds a well, the angels cry, what are you doing? Don't you know the Suris, the Jewish people are going to suffer at the hands of the children of Ishmael? And God, according to this Midrash says, right now in front of me, there's a child. Right now, this child is innocent. Look, I know some Palestinians would want to kill me and my children. I know some Israelis do not see Palestinians as human and use the law to keep us separate. But when I visit Palestinians, they waken their children to meet us in the caves where they live after their house was demolished. We sit on packed suitcases as they serve me tea. Their son who'd been tied to a windshield by the army and the man in a kippa who'd come to his aid. And I wanted to show um, a video as well. Is this visible? Phil and Michael, can you see this? Okay, good, thank you. 
So in the West Bank during the 2000s, Israel built a separation barrier between itself and, and Palestinian territories. Um, however, this wall was often built on Palestinian land and divided Palestinian communities from each other, from their own land, and, uh, and from their olive groves. There were many protests during this period, um, many of them nonviolent, but also there was, you know, of course, uh, other activities happening, stones thrown and things like that. Uh, during this time, Hueda Araf, an incredibly brave Palestinian American who had started an organization with her husband, Adam Shapiro, um, which was called the International Solidarity Movement, got involved in, um, in standing with uh, Palestinians who are nonviolently protesting. And this is a poem about something that she did, which you're gonna see in a minute here, about an incredibly courageous um, intervention that she made. It's called The Dance of the Activists and the Typhus for Huida Araf. She inserts the inked ribbon of herself between the black roller of history and the alphabetic metal legs of that inverted insect. Rifles thrash the air, the targets scatter. She can't help it. Something in her grows each time she turns to face the rifle. Grows as she covers its permanent erection. The typist lifts his wrists and legs hover to stamp. Where the rifle moves, she moves. A mirror following the lead of inevitable lead. She's the rifle unfired, shield of flesh, her arms overhead before the muzzle as if she could cradle a bullet. I think I have time for one more poem. There's so much to say, there's so much to share, um, but I don't wanna give you, give you too much to chew on. Um, so I think I'm gonna end with a poem called Izdud. Izdud was a village that was destroyed in 1948 alongside hundreds of other villages when Palestinians uh, fled or were expelled um, during the violence that blew up from November of 1947 through the declaration of the State of Israel in 1948 until the armistice. There were 700,000 Palestinians who were made refugees um, many of them not only lost uh, their, their houses and their, their country, but they, they lost any opportunity to ever return. Um, my friend Fadi Judah um, is a Palestinian American and you know, his email was East Dude, and I won't tell you the rest, but East Dude at something something. And I said, what is East Dude? I didn't know. And he said, that's the village that my parents were expelled from. Um, and so, learning that and learning a little bit more about that history of what happened, the Nakba, as Palestinians call it, 1947 and 48, um, gave me a renewed appreciation for the trauma at the heart of the Palestinian story. So this is a poem which celebrates his beautiful poems, his dervish-like poems. By the way, Mahmoud Darwish, the famous Palestinian poet, Darwish is actually the, the, the Arabic word for dervish. Um, as you know, spinning, and Fatty's a wonderful transla translator of uh, Darwish. So the last thing that's referenced in this poem is that there are images you can find online of a, an old refugee um, having the opportunity to visit the place he came from, and all that's left there are ruins. Um, so is dude for Fatty Judah. Dear descendant of the disappeared, you ascend the pillar of your own air, spin and span whole abysses with lines translating there to here and here to where wind winds in dry waddies, hoists sea in handful after invisible handful, is dude now an email address and digital image of branches through windows within school ruins. A refugee points with his cane to what he only can see. You argue against the argument against yourself you yourself make and home in. Kiss my blind eyes clear. Close keyholes with opening. Homeland, you 
cradle in vowels, what was not never yours. I'll hold it here till you return. Thanks everybody. That's great. Wow. Yeah. What do you think, Phil? I, that was fantastic. And on the, you know, since you've tied the questions of peacemaking and and um, and, and for Tele2T, uh, then to this sort of like sense of historical memory um, and, and rootedness. I mean, rootedness is one of the words that I, that I think of when I'm thinking about this book. And, and one of the reasons is because of this recurring image of trees. Um, and there's this sometimes tension um, between sort of a uh, kind of respect for local tradition, local culture, right? Um, uh, you know, a lot of bad things um, have been justified by people claiming they're trying to preserve their way of life. Um, but then also there's a lot of sort of deeply important things and people trying to be rooted in a place. And one of the, the points that Francis makes is that a kind of respect for local tradition and local culture and local communities is not at odds with the universal cult of the, uh, of the church. He says, we are more alone than ever in an increasingly massified world that promotes individual interests and weakens the communitarian dimensions of life. Um, and he, in a way, the sort of... <laughs> Uh, the way to promote peacemaking is not through simply um, sort of broad impersonal solutions, so they must be a part of it. Um, but also, you know, he says peace is not achieved by normative frameworks and institutional arrangements between well meaning political or economic groups. It is always helpful to incorporate into our peace processes the experience of those sectors that have often been overlooked so that communities themselves can influence the development of a collective memory. And so there's that sense of building up and strengthening local groups, associations through which people on the ground can both express themselves and their culture and um, and have some degree of power. And there's a moment in the book where, uh, uh, this is from one of the poems. He passed an olive tree necklace to you saying, a country is more important than one person. You'd carry its quandary 10 years around your wandering. And now this country draws you the way olive roots welcome our water. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, um, not just that sort of tension between the local and the um, and the universal, but also mm -hmm. the tension between multiple local traditions and cultures, because of course, part of the problem here is there are multiple communities with roots in the same soil. Thanks, Phil. Um, it's wonderfully put. Um, I mean, one, one answer to this, um, conundrum or one place to look is that at, at how community is there and how people not only like Robert Eric Osherman who are engaging in sort of, I don't know, quite spectacular acts of courage, but, um, but also uh, local groups um, that, you know, uh, there's a sort of settler community um, that uh, had some particularly visionary members and um, began to be in relationship in, in a sort of proactive relationship with their Palestinian neighbors in ways that weren't, um, that were very intentional and, and about trying to overcome what they recognized was a situation of uh, not only deep division, but um, uh, of, an, of an unhealthy uh, sort of um, uh, relationship. And so that's one place that we can look on the ground, as as uh, Pope Francis says, to to communities that that are doing that work. Um, there's always a tension between the local and the universal, or the local and the national. You know, and and this is not only our own tradition. I mean, it's so interesting, right? Catholicism is is not really a tradition anchored in root in 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 place the way that Judaism is. I mean, just as, as an obs observation, right? Um, mm -hmm. That 
it was an attempt sort of early on to make it a universal faith. Um, and uh, so, you know, in, you know, I can't speak in, in any, you know, I don't know, nuance to, to this question of, you know, within Judaism, the questions about whether or not um, uh, one's faith is, you know, are, are we appealing to a sort of like a, a, a local or universal sensibility of what, how are, how we are to be in the world? Um, and I, all those questions are certainly around um, the questions of the state uh, of Israel, of course. Um, what does it mean to, um, you know, to have a religious state in this way? Um, yeah, I mean, Palestinians would say that, um, you know, we, we belong, we're part of the soil, we've been here for hundreds, thousands of years, and, uh, you know, Israelis would say, but we, we've, we've returned, you know, we've, we've had a long time away, and we've returned. Palestinians would say, no, that's, you know, this is just a kind of colonialism, um, and is, Israelis and Jews would say that's, that's unfair, you know, that doesn't articulate our reality. Mm -hmm. And we'll go around that carousel, you know, and um, I can't, uh, I can't answer or, uh, you know, I don't, it's not my job to say what the reality is. All that I can see is um, two peoples whose, whose histories and narratives have told them that the world uh, is against them and that their situation of precarity um, needs to be responded to with uh, not only perseverance, but, um, but strength. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, that's a really difficult situation, but it's not unique in the world. This exact same dynamic was there, has been in there in Northern Ireland. In some ways it was there in South Africa and, and elsewhere. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but. Yeah, yeah. And so, so then what is the, <laughs> What is the responsibility for the poet then? Yeah, yeah. Um, you well, know, and a, and that's a question I can answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, I felt like it wasn't my job to write a book of advocacy or social justice, although I'm sure some people might read it that way. I think that the the book is trying to do, um, trying to illuminate the ways in which um, there are serious uh, power differentials, uh, you know, between, you know. Um, you know, the parties involved. Um, but I thought my job was to, to, to abide with um, and to try as best I could to, uh, to encounter the, the voices that, um, that I, you know, researched and, and ta talked with and, and, um, and imagined um, in ways that might help us all come to not simply a complicated understanding, but a um, but an actionable one, I guess. And 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 so to move from a set of frozenness and a set of shame about what our church has done and what you know all of the injustices of you know our own tradition relative to this situation, but also to play a role of um, recognition for what what has happened. Um, and with recognition then comes repentance and after mm -hmm. repentance comes repair, reparation, and maybe after that, maybe something like reconciliation. Um, so I wanted to play a role that was, um, one of accompaniment, um, encounter and, uh, an attempt to understand um, and invite others into that understanding. That's uh, br brilliant and um, edifying and inspiring. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, <laughs> be fatuous here, Philip, at all. Um, you know, what you do do as a poet is, is the, 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 uh, one of these great phrases that you said in, uh, with the rabbi poem, you know, you cradle the reality in vows. You know, there's 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 a lovingness there. Levertov herself talked about poetry as an abode of mercy. Um, 
And I don't know if they can work that way. Again, mercy is a very problematic term for, as you put it out, Phil. But, you know, on, on the point, because when you're... I'm, I'm pro-mercy. I just want to be clear. I, I know you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on the yeah. record, pro-mercy. <laughs> pro-mercy. I, 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 pro I, I think it should be registered that there are folks who are not, right? You're, you're right. You're right. <laughs> and, the, and, and, the, and not in a flippant way, you know? No, no, you're right. And I, ha I have you down as pro-mercy, as, as difficult as that is for all of us to, to do. <laughs> um, Philip Metris, uh you're indicating but, but by the way i i think that's really important actually and yeah. and it's interesting because i was thinking about this in terms of you know what i was talking about earlier in this kind of small c conservative way that the art the artist kind of approaches the world which is trying to describe it right but then there's also this sort of way of you know you you you're approaching the world and i'm thinking about something philip like the section uh, i think it's called theater of operations where you have all of these different sort of poems from different voices around, um, you know, a uh, bombing, and there's a way in which the there's um, there's great care to the individual perspectives, right, and the and the individual sort of political certainties, you know, um, of 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 the characters, you know, uh, the, you know, the man who wants you know, simply have no a child who will laugh without fear, but why am I still afraid of this Arab here, right? My tongue wrestles with new words, so why do I taste metal like blood in my mouth, in the mouth? Why do I feel so alive this close to death? Um, but then there's also something in the arrangement and the way in which you're guiding us through these experiences that I think um, the, the intention certainly seems to me to be in that other way, that, that more revolutionary role um, that art can play in which through the guiding of, of an individual through these experiences, not as I'm, I'm intending you to evaluate these, these as political arguments, but rather as kind of effective experiences that I'm trying to immerse you in um, yeah. that might change one's perspective um, or sort of open up new possibilities. Uh, around the situation. Yeah, that's, that's something of a Dante move there. You have, you have any thought on that, Phil Metris? I'm grateful for your careful and close reading. And I, I think that that's right, you know, I mean, yeah. And, and the, the hazard of writing a book like this is of course, it, it upsets everyone because it's upsetting. <laughs> All of it is upsetting. Right. All of it is upsetting. Um, but that's, that's, that was just, I, you know, I, I felt after all these years that, that I had something that I needed to say about it. And um, uh, may I be forgiven for all the ways in which I failed to understand, you know, people's realities. <laughs> you know, uh, we're pro-mercy pro over here. We're so. pro-mercy. We've established the fact that we're Lucky pro for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, we don't, our, our memory is short. Uh, our forgiveness is, is long. Hey, Phil, uh, Phil Metris, you know, also another concept I think you um, are, are fond of and you, that you practice so beautifully is the idea of palimpsest. Right. So, and that's the kind of cartography part of your, of your work. Your work is so innovative. There's so many forms happening here. And then you're mixing in kind of tourism posters. Uh, it, you know, you're evoking a sense of place, you're evoking complexity. But I, you know, I just, I want, you know, I just wanted to say that, that there's something I think very Catholic. If there's not a sense of place with being a Catholic, there is something about, about um, moments about, about uh, incarnational understanding. So, and that's a place. You know, and so the, the Catholic imagination wants to get small and fond and local, as Mary Carr might say, but then it wants to be cosmopolitan as well. And I think you do that in your work. You know, you take uh, Jaffa and Tel Aviv and you see the layers there. Uh, so I think that's an expert sequence toward the end of the book there. Any thought about that? From your lips to God's ears. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, I, I do, uh, I wanted to write a book that was an immersive experience um, that was both, uh, you know, poems and uh, images and, you know, documents and um, be because going back to this thing that I asked Phil about, because I think that um, if we, rem if our conversation remains on the level of the individual, the sacred human, the one who has dignity, that, that, um, that's important, but there are all these systems we have to contend with in which we find ourselves. And that, that's why some of those other layers, I hope provide a dimensionality that, um, that opens us to 
what these large operations of states and of uh, powers do to peoples. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, you've done it. Now we're getting toward the end of our time. I have a little special kind of tableau I want to show you. I want you to know that there haven't been that many questions. And I think it's because that the conversation and the, and the work has been so rich. There's been a couple from Ed Hart and things like, uh, do you think that the emphasis on military solutions to conflict has blinded our imagining other ways of conflict revolution, things like that? I'd like you to hold that thought because I think what I'm gonna show you, it's about a four minute clip, four and a half minute clip from the film Atonement directed by Joe Wright. This is meant to be kind of a part of our liturgy so I'll ask folks to stay until 5.33 because I want Phil and Phil to close. But uh, as you watch this, this short clip, it's one shoot, it's one take, it's a long take, five minutes. It is one of the best bits of film I think I can think of, people. This is, this is cinematic history here. Uh, just the background, we have uh, James McAvoy's character uh, trying to get home uh, to his, his love. Uh, and there's some uh, conflict there as well. This is the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940. The movie came out in 2005, I think. The novel, late 90s, I believe, if memory serves, by Ian McEwan. One thing you have to know is that McAvoy's character has a bullet, has a bullet in his gut, and no one knows it except for him. And I think the rest speaks for itself. It's a living tableau of what Phil Metris wrote for our description of this. Uh, how violence, warfare, and oppression are mediated through an imagination that knows the profound failure of such human endeavors. So please, without further ado, it's about four and a half minutes. I'm gonna share my screen and turn up your volume. Joe Wright, Atonement, 2005, I think. And here we go. Than yesterday, Luftwaffe blew them to bugger it. I lost 3,000 men when they sang Lancaster. High command in his infinite wisdom is denying us air cover. Disgrace. Fucking disaster. Look, look, the thing is, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm expected back, you see. There's over 300,000 men on this street, private. You have to wait your turn. It'd be great if you're not wounded. I'd always leave a wounded behind. No, 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 leave it, Gav. Never trust the state of dry land. You're best all part of it.
Well, that's the, the, the music in there is James Lee, Greenleaf Whittier, the Quaker, uh, from Dear, Dear Lord, excuse me. After finishing the last Bond movie, I wanted to try and find something that I've never <laughs> heard about that. That's, that's the, <laughs> that is the teacher's uh, <laughs> foe. Anyway, to, to, to conclude, sorry about that. That's James Greenleaf Whittier's piece, Dear Lord, Father of Mankind, very male obviously, and uh, the ironies are, are manifold. Uh, the beauty of thy peace in the middle of that carnival-like uh, carnage. But what, do, what, you know, just to wrap, uh, any final thoughts uh, just on everything we've, we've been through today? And uh, Phil Claw, you first, please. This has been, this has been really lovely. Um, you know, I, it's funny thinking of that quick clip, I'm thinking about a, a bit from, um, Ford Maddox Ford's parade then where one character saying it's beastly war, this beastly war and, and the main character, you know, it's an encouraging sight, you know, as he's looking at it, soldiers going off to the front and he says, you know, the beastliness of human nature is, is always pretty normal. We lie and cheat and steal in war as well as in peace. But here you've got, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of men marching towards some place that they don't want to go. They desperately don't want to go. Uh, and they're going. And um, <laughs> of course, it's, it's, it's towards a, a senseless slaughter uh, in that book. Um, but I think the, there's something sort of um, profoundly powerful and human um, that you can see in war and tremendously inspiring um, as well. Um, but that all too often is harnessed in the worst of all possible ways. Um, and I think that the, uh, you know, it is, it's, 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 a, it's, a, <laughs> it's a messy, complicated subject, but, uh, you know, I'm certainly glad there are folks like Philip trying to think and imagine their way through it. I think you're right to, to include that, Phil Clyde, because it's the truth. It's a very, uh, it is the center of anthropology to realize that we navigate opposites. The Chris Hedges' book, 2002, that war is a force that, that gives, mm -hmm. that, that provides meaning. I think he's after that in his classical reading. But Philip Metris, the last word is yours, my friend. So what's your, what are your observations as we kind of conclude today? I'm just, I'm grateful to have been engaging in conversation with each of you. And I, I wish that we could uh, speak with everyone who's been listening. Um, uh, I, obviously, you can contact me anytime, uh, you know, via my email address, which is at the John Carroll website, of course. Um, you know, my hope is that uh, that as we develop our capacities for um, for for peacemaking and and um, that we develop a, a, a as um, as vivacious and as vigorous and as courageous a tradition in that area as we do and have in our warrior um, context, in the context of war. I mean, I think that that's, that's where um, 
my hope is that we can grow as, as, as people, as Catholics, um, and maybe as a species to find ways to find the moral equivalent of war as uh, William James once called it, um, where, where men see their, uh, their men see ways and, and women of, of course as well, but people see ways um, that they can be fully themselves and the agents of their own destiny, not through violence, but through um, mercy, kindness, generosity, and love. Thank you. I think it's, we had a couple late observations come in. So I'll let you know, I will happily have a, a couple of women who responded. Uh, really grateful to notice again, this is Dr. Naomi Fisher, that art um, doesn't provide false reductions. And I think we're hearing that and I, that's wonderful. A student, Moni, Mona Tariq, uh, is always noticing this statement, all art and media are political. Um, I think you're right, Mona, uh, uh, we, we can't escape it. So with that, and with, uh, I wanna thank everybody, I wanna thank Megan and Kathleen for getting us organized. I wanna thank Phil Cly and congratulate you on your, on your wonderful book. And Philip Metris, I wanna congratulate you on your wonderful book. And I wanna thank you for stopping by the Hank Center and peace be with everybody. And may you find mercy in your life. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.